It is so great to be with you today. It is, uh, it is a beautiful day in the UP. Right? Amen? No, nobody said anything there. Just, just kind of a little worried about you guys. Oh, we're continuing our series called Major in the Minors and the Major Truth from the Minor Prophets. Today that we're going to look at is taken from the book of Amos. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy Amos. He prophesied uh, in the northern kingdom of Israel in the mid-8th century B.C. His ministry took place around the same time as Isaiah's did, but Isaiah was, he was the, the prophet. Amos is what we call one of the minor prophets, and he did not hold the official office of prophet, uh, but yet we see God using him in this way. And his ministry took place two years before a massive earthquake, which we read about in Amos chapter 1, verse 1. It literally starts out and it talks about this earthquake. And so he is interpreting what God and, and, and would interpret um, that, that this earthquake two years later would be part of God's judgment on Israel. And so he's, he's talking in this time frame. Uh, interesting, the, the land around the, 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 the nation of Israel. Um, I, I didn't realize this, but there are many fault lines that go through that area of the world. And the biggest of them, the most significant of them, is called... The, the Dead Sea Transform, and I didn't know this, but literally that fault line is the, the, the fault line that is responsible for the most catastrophic earthquakes that happen in that part of the world. And so there's, there's something that, that we can understand from this scientifically that the seabed of the Dead Sea literally acts like a, a, a tape recorder recording all of the, the seismic activity, all the, the geological activity that happens in that, in that part of the world. Uh, and it does so literally because deposits fall to the, the floor of the seabed, and if nothing disrupts them, they will literally give an uninterrupted history. But when an earthquake comes, there is a disturbance in those deposits and scientists are able to, to detect earthquakes. And so through carbon-14 dating, scientists are able to place historically two major earthquakes that would have happened during Amos' ministry, eight centuries before Christ. Some scholars actually believe that the earlier quake of the two was a magnitude of 8.0 on the Richter scale. That is a huge earthquake. So at the time of Amos' writing, the northern kingdom, two years before the earthquake, was at the height of its territorial expansion. It was at the height of its political peace. It was at the height of its national prosperity. But inwardly, it was rotten. So there's a, a huge difference between the inward and the outward in the nation of Israel. There was hypocrisy. There was idolatrous religion that was taking place. There was immorality. There was a corrupt judicial system. And there was incredible oppression of the poor. I say all of that just to bring us to Amos chapter 7, reading verses 7 and 8. You follow along as I read. This is what the Lord, this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, see, uh, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. This scene is a, it's, it's a mental picture or a vision that God is revealing to Amos concerning his people. God wants Amos to speak to the king 
about what he's been shown in order that the nation would know that judgment is coming upon them with the ultimate goal of repentance. We see this over and over. We've talked about uh, Jonah and the, the great fish and the city of Nineveh. What happened? God sent Jonah to Nineveh to speak and to tell them that the judgment of God was coming. And what happened? The people of Nineveh repented of their sin, and God relented of his judgment. We see that the purpose of God sending his judgment in the Old Testament was to bring about repentance. So for us today, what can we learn from Amos chapter 7? What can we learn from this minor prophet? I think there are three things that that we can learn that I want to share with you today. The first one is this. God is exceeding patient, exceedingly patient. Most of the first six chapters of the book of Amos are a list of the sins of Amos' people. And there's a lot of stuff in there. And they're they're not a good people. And that region is not a, a good region. And I think God finally has had enough. And he just cries out, that's it. Now, how many of you parents have ever got to that point? Those of you that don't have kids, okay, here's what I know what you're thinking. Why does he always use examples about having kids? Because it is so real and so true, and it's even a little fun. You, you get to that point where you are, you are just beyond yourself. For the last 20 minutes, you have been saying, okay, I'm in the car, right? You've been saying, don't make me pull this car around. I will. You've been saying that for 20 minutes, okay? And then finally, you got, it just, it, it hits, okay? And you, you slam on the brakes and pull over to the side of the road, and you're just wagging your finger in their face, and, and, and you, you've, you've finally done it. You've actually pulled over, and they're terrified because you pull over. But we get to that place where, where we're just, we've had enough. We're just done. We have had enough. That is the place where God is at this time. He has had enough and he is declaring through Amos, you know what, I have had enough. God's done this several times in history. We read about Noah and the great boat that, that God had him build. Why? Because every thought of man was evil all the time. God said, I have had enough. I'll tell you what, I praise God for the rainbow because God says, I'll never do that again. But regionally, God is saying, I've had enough. These are my people. This this was the equivalent. Well, we, we would most compare it to the church of the New Testament. These were God's people in the Old Testament. He said, I've had enough. You guys are, you, you have just, you've driven me over the edge. And he's preparing two events of judgment on his people. The first one was locusts. The locusts were going to come and they were going to eat everything. This was not uncommon in the Old Testament. We read uh, in, in the book of Exodus, we read about uh, the, the, the plague of locusts in the land, that they literally came through in Egypt and they ate everything. And after this plague of locusts would come through here that God was, was talking about that he was going to send, then there would be fire that would come. And you see, God was going to send this at just the right time. You see, because in, in, in this area of the world and at this time, the first crop of the year would go to the king as his payment, as his tribute. And then after that first crop would be taken in, then that second crop that would just be starting to sprout, that's when the locust would come. And so there would literally be nothing left for Israel. And Amos begs God, and he says, God, Israel is too small. She's not big enough. She cannot survive. God, please don't do this. 
after the locusts would come the fire. If the locusts haven't eaten it, if anything's still going to grow at that point, that fire's going to come through and going to sweep through. Not only destroy anything that might grow, it's going to destroy anything that possibly could come back to life. Now, jack pine, we know, could grow after a fire, right? But not a lot of other stuff can. And so, literally, Amos is, is begging God, God, please don't do this to your people. And the scripture tells us that, that God had a change of heart. He, God, or Amos pleaded on their behalf. We see this in Genesis chapter 18, where God says to Abraham, Abraham, you know, the cry, the outcry of the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah has reached me. And it's so bad, I actually have to go down and see what it's like for myself. Now, I don't understand this, because I would imagine that God could just know it, okay? But he decides to literally go down himself. And it says that there were three men that had visited Abraham, and they were going to Sodom and Gomorrah. And God had decided to bring judgment on their wickedness. Now, Abraham knew that his son Lot was there in Sodom and Gomorrah, or his nephew Lot was there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we read in Genesis chapter 18 that Abraham begins bargaining with God. And he says to God, will you sweep away the righteous along with the wicked? Would you spare those cities if if you could find 50 who are righteous? And God says, you know, Abraham, you bring up a good point. I don't want to sweep away the righteous with, the, with uh, the wicked. So if I can find 50 who are righteous in those two cities, I will not bring judgment upon them. And we know what judgment eventually was, right? We know that it literally, that fire came down and literally consumed them. So he said, I, I won't bring judgment against them. Abraham then, he said, uh, well, Lord, you know, 50 is five, you know, it's not a big difference, but what, 45? 45? If, if you can find 45 that are righteous, why would you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And, and God says, you know, Abraham, you, you bring up a good point. Five's not that, that really that big of a difference. So, okay, 45. Now, I do not understand what would have possessed Abraham, but Abraham said, Lord, <laughs> What about 40? Really, Lord, if, 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 if 40, would you, really, would you really bring judgment upon them and sweep the righteous away with the wicked? How about 40, Lord? Do I hear 40? And, 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 and God, so this is the first auctioneer that's ever existed, and it's in reverse. And, and God says, I, and, and I think God had to be laughing. You know, come on, it, God cannot be swindled, all right? And he, say, he says, all right, Abraham, I, I'll, I'll do it, you know. I, if, if we find only 40, and then, now Abraham's really getting bold because he's been, he's been just going down by increments of five. Now he says, okay, God, what? 30, okay. He, he ups it to 10. God, 30, if, if you can just find 30 who are righteous, why would you sweep away the righteous with the, the wicked? And God says, all right, 30 it is. God, what, what, just bear with me, Lord, but, but what, what about 20? If we can find 20. And, and God, some, I don't know why, God agrees with him and says, okay, all right, tw- if I find 20, I will not bring judgment. The angels are about ready to leave and, and head for Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham speaks up one more time and he said, I, I know I've asked a lot of you, Lord. I, I know that we've gone around and around here, but, but what about 10? What about 10? If we find 10 that are righteous, would you spare the cities? And God said to Abraham, yes, I will. I will spare them if I find 10. The scripture is filled with examples of God relenting in his judgment. Moses begged God. 
He, God, do you, do you know that God said to Moses, listen, these children of Israel are so corrupt, I'm going to destroy all of them, and I'm going to start over with you. That'd make you feel pretty good about yourself, wouldn't it? I'm going to start over with just you. And Moses begged God, God, don't do this to your people. Think of what the nations would say. And he begged God, and God relented. In Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do you see that? Literally because of his compassion, we we are not consumed for our sin right here and right now because God could do that, but God has decided to be compassionate. He has decided to be merciful. I'm so glad that that's the kind of God that we serve. He is a God that is exceedingly patient. The Bible makes it clear, however, that one day there will be an accounting for sin. In his second letter to the apostle, or in his second letter, the apostle Peter wrote about the day of the Lord, and he said that there's going to be scoffers who are following their evil desires, and they're going to come, and that's going to prompt judge, the judgment of ungodly men. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, here's what Peter writes. This is awesome. He said, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's talking about judgment. Are you getting this? With the Lord, a a, a thousand years is as a day, a day is as a thousand years. God is not slow in keeping his promise to bring judgment. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God patiently waits because he wants everyone to escape the coming judgment. I'm telling you this right now, friends. I am convinced that some of us in this room, some of us in the hub or out in the cafe, some of us that are watching online have survived only because of a praying mother or a praying grandmother. Even beyond God's mercy. She did what Moses did. She did what Amos did. And she begged God God do something in his life. I remember as a kid, I've told you this story before. My mother fasted and prayed while I was at Bible camp one week as I was, when I was a teenager. At the end of that week, she was so excited to see what God had done in my life. I got off the bus in the church parking lot and the first words out of her mouth were, Well, Kev, how was camp? She was waiting with bated breath to hear the great things that God had done in my life. And I said, and I quote, the girls were great. (laughs) How many of us, how many of us have survived physically, emotionally, and spiritually because our mothers were praying for us. Oh God, don't give him what he deserves, but be compassionate. Move in his life. The second thing that we can learn from Amos is that God's word is the standard Look at our text again, if you would. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that happened, or that had been built true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. What is, here's the question, what is a plumb line? What is a plumb line? 
because it's a real thing and it's something that we still use today. But basically, it's a string with a weight attached to the bottom of it. That's all it is. But do you realize that without that tool, you cannot find a straight vertical line? Anything else that you use to find a straight vertical line is simply working off the same premise. That's what a plumb line is. A really good pastor would have had a string and some washers on it to show you exactly what a plumb line is. And how many times I thought, I got to get a string. Even during worship, I got to get a string. Where's the string in this church? Do you know that a plumb line doesn't change or move with the whim of a carpenter? That it always remains true. And it literally will find what we, uh, we exact vertical. Okay? It is exact. Doesn't matter where you, you, you do it. Doesn't matter what the circumstance is. That's the reality. It remains true. All the work has to line up to it or risk being crooked. Now, here's the next question. Why is a plumb line always true? Ooh, this is getting good. Why is it always true? Well, I'll tell you why. It's based on a law. Okay? It's not based on a theory. It's based on a law. And that happens to be a law of gravity. How many of you have ever heard the story of Sir Isaac Newton sitting under an apple tree and an apple fell and hit him in the head and he said, ah, gravity. Have you heard that? I, have you heard that story before? It's a bunch of baloney. In 1726, Newton was meeting with his biographer, William Stuckey. And he told him the story of the apple tree. And in 1752, Stuckey published it as part of Newton's memoirs. But in 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published one of the greatest scientific books which was ever written in which he presented his theory of universal gravitation. Newton's theory said that gravity is universal. You know, and, and all of us experience gravity, okay? And, and gravity is actually not a strong force. It's actually considered a weak force. And you can break temporarily. You can, you can show something that, that would go against gravity. When you throw something up in the air... While it's going up in the air, it's working against gravity. But the problem is it's directly correlated with the force that you actually throw that object with. But eventually, it is going to come to the ground. Another thing a good pastor would do would be have an apple here. <laughs> because we're talking about Newton. And if I took that apple and I had it in my hand and I released it, what would happen to that apple? applesauce okay it's going to fall it's going to fall to the ground with a thud unless something else interrupts it okay if I had a string tied to it that string would interrupt it the, the power of gravity is universal but it's 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 something that can be interrupted okay but gravity it's been researched. It's been uh, duplicated time and time again. It's no longer a theory. It can be so proven again and again that it is now considered a law. So after showing the plumb line, <laughs> I was just waiting to see who would come to my rescue. What do we have? Oh, we, oh, hey, I got a new vehicle. <laughs> and somebody doesn't have shoelaces. There you go. There's the plumb. We even have a point at the bottom of it. Look at that. That is awesome. There's our plumb line. 
It's vertical every time. Every time. Now I lost my place. <laughs> so, so now after showing him the plumb line, God tells Amos that he's setting a plumb line among his people. Okay? He said, I'm setting the plumb line among the people. And that means something. That tells us something. God is saying, I'm going to set among you a standard to which you will be held accountable. Just like the plumb line would tell us, if a wall is straight, it's always true, okay? What the standard that God set before them had to be something that would be consistently true. Are you with me? God is not going to use a standard that's not always true. So what is the standard? Okay? In the Old Testament, it would have been called what? The law. John 17, verse 17. Jesus, we read in his prayer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is what? Truth. That's the standard. That's the only straight line on which you can build your life is God's word. Do you get it? Do you see what I'm saying? If you build your life according to any other standard, it will not be, I'm using the word true, it will not be true. It will not be straight. Okay? Because the standard that God has provided for us is his word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. We read this all the time. This is just one of those sets of verses that you read. Uh, it doesn't matter what you preach. You could throw this in there and it's going to apply. Okay? All right? So don't judge how good a preacher is if he uses 2 Timothy uh, three sixteen and 17. Uh, all scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. What do you do with a, with a wall that you put a, a, a plumb bob or a plumb line to that's, that doesn't measure up? You straighten it. Or in the UP, you say, that's good enough for me. This is the, it's the only standard there is, okay? It's the only truth. God's word is always true. It has stood the test of time. It has been tested by millions. Scripture says of itself that not, a, a, a Jesus, not even, not a, a dot of an I, not the cross of a T will, 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 uh, will fade away until my word has completely come to pass. None of it's going to change. Why? <laughs> because what's true does not change. It is always accurate. It is always the same. It is always true. So number three, here's what we can learn. Be a wise builder. In Amos' prophecy, God's word is the plumb line. His people are the wall. Did you know that God makes a lot of uh, comparisons with you and I as buildings? You know that? How many of you went to Sunday school when you were a kid? Raise your hand. Tell me if you were, if you were in Sunday school. A lot of people were in Sunday school as a kid. There was a song, and I loved songs when I was a kid uh, in Sunday school. And one of those songs was, The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the... No, that's... that's no, the house on the rock stood firm. Okay, let's... <laughs> I don't, you guys skipped Sunday school, didn't you? You're a bunch of skippers, all of you. The second part, the wise man, or the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Okay? And the house on the sand went, do you remember what we used to do? Splat! You think, that's just a little kid's song. Well, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells the story. 
He tells the story about two men that were building homes. One chose to build it on the rock, the other on the sand. The rock is likened to hearing Jesus' words or the word of God and doing them. The sand is like hearing Jesus' words and not doing them. It says, the rain came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and... Okay, so that was all part of the song, but it's a part of the scripture. That's what happened. And when that happened, when the winds blew, the rains came, the troubles of life came, the house that was on the sand, it literally was destroyed. It collapsed and great was the crash thereof. But the one who built on the rock, the foundation of the word of God, that house stood firm. That is a story for you and I. Let me ask you a question. Would you consider... Building a house. And we, we could build a straight house from Sierra's set of keys and her shoelaces. <laughs> Do you realize that? We could, because that's true vertical. Would you ever consider building a house without a level? No. Our house was built in the late 70s, and I pretty sure somebody did that. (laughs) They had levels in the UP in the late 70s. Come on. You wouldn't do it, would you? Why? Because it's too valuable. It's too important. My wife would kill me. Lots of reasons why. We We would never think of building a house without using a level. But how many people build their own lives without the the truth of God's word? And you think, well, come on. Is there really a... Yeah, yeah, God gave you what's called an eternal spirit that will live on after death. And and what we do with the word of God determines what's going to happen after we leave this world. And so the the reality is that our eternal spirit is far more important. And yet we, we build it according to whatever we see in society. We need to build it on his word. We need to be good builders. So let me ask you this. What are you building your life on? Wealth, accomplishments, pleasure, experience. The next question is what's going to happen when the wind blows? When the storm beats upon your life, will it stand firm or will it collapse? Has it been built with that which will endure the test of time? One day we will give an account of our lives. We will stand before God. Hebrews says this in chapter 4, verse 13, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Build your life on the foundational rock of Jesus Christ and the word of God. And I close with these words, and they've just, the last couple days, haven't been able to get rid of them, and so... This morning I included them into my notes from Daniel chapter 5, verse 27. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. God is exceedingly patient with us. His word is the standard and we must be wise builders because one day our lives will be weighed. So, Father, I thank you for your graciousness. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your compassion. I thank you that your word says that you would, that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And that literally a a thousand years is as a day, a day is as a thousand years. You're not slow, you just want people to come to repentance. But the day will come when we will stand before you. And when that day comes, Father, what I want to hear myself is, 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's rest. Father, I don't want to hear that my life has been weighed in the scales and been found wanting. Father, I pray for the hearts of those that are within the sound of my voice right now. I pray that the conviction of your Holy Spirit, which may be speaking to them right now, would reverberate through their mind. Applying the truth of this simple, crude tool of a plumb line. Applying it to their heart. Applying it to their mind. Lord, I pray that in this moment that the Holy Spirit will be drawing hearts in a powerful way. Father, I pray Lord, for that one that's here, that that five or ten that are here, that right now they're fighting against that drawing. Digging their heels in, saying, God, it's, it's not time for me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just between you and God, nobody's looking around say, Pastor, God is speaking to my heart. He is drawing me. And I realize that God has been patient with me. I believe that he's been merciful with me. He's been compassionate. Maybe it's a praying mom or a praying grandma that has gotten you through to this point, but that's not what's going to make it all the way to the end. You say, today, today I want to ask God, to bring my life into alignment with his truth. If that's you this morning, I just want you to reach your hand up toward heaven as we get ready to pray. Yes, 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 yes. Hands all over this room. Father, you see these hands. Each of them are crying out because the Holy Spirit is moving in their hearts right now. And Lord, we know that that process is not easy. We know that there's going to have to be some some foundational things restored. We know there's going to have to be some supports that are changed. We know that there's going to have to be an alignment, and, and it's not going to necessarily be easy. But God, we want our lives to be in alignment with your word. I thank you because you're moving in hearts. Thank you for watching the message today. If you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, or if you have questions about your personal walk with Jesus Christ, we'd love to help answer those questions. We've prepared something specifically for you. It's a five-day devotional called Walk by Faith. We'd love to give you this as our gift to you today. Please contact us using the information provided for you on the screen. May God bless you.